And uh, so I, I guess we are all looking forward to have a lot of inspiring ideas from Cristo. A little bit about the, how it's going to look like. Cristo will deliver a presentation, and then we will have Q&As. We have an hour, a little bit more than an hour. So it, it all depends on how it goes. And uh, I, when you will make questions, I will ask you please to stick to the question, not make too many comments around so that many people can do questions. And you will need to press a button because this is, uh, is a stream online right now. So when you will make the question, the people on the other side will be able to see you and listen to you, okay? Christo, welcome. I think these, this doesn't working okay so I came to Riga for a, for a little conference where I was on a panel for some er European regulatory thing we had a very abstract discussion about collaborative economy and so on and then I thought it would be cool if I'm in Riga that we can actually you know meet real people who uh, um, who are gonna eventually build something in this economy so I was uh, really glad to be invited here and uh, I mean, usually I don't like to do slides and presentations, uh, but if Latvians are anything <laughs> like Estonians, then if I ask you to ask me questions, then I would get nothing. <laughs> so in order to fo warm you up, um, I have about 45 minutes um, of questions coming if you want to. Um, I, I just thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit about the story. So it looks like not a lot of you have used TransferWise, and I'm really sorry for that. Uh, um, I'm I'm really sorry that we didn't manage to add uh, Latvian lats on the on the platform just because uh, you got to European uh, eurozone before before we we were able to add lats um and I think that was a better decision anyway I calculated at one point that um Latvia probably saves like all the, just the people of Latvia and the economy saves about 180 million euros every year uh, for not having to exchange from LATS to euros and back. It's just uh, the little margin that uh, the banks, not just Latvian banks, but also the, uh, the banks elsewhere in the world would be would be getting getting from you. So you made a good choice. You went to the eurozone. Uh, it's actually better than maybe some of the economists might say. Um, it actually works. But um, the, not everyone is in Eurozone yet, so that's why we, uh, we still need TransferWise. The, um, the way that it started, just to kind of fill you in, about six years, actually about ten years ago, I moved to London from Estonia, and um, um, I had a very good salary. It was awesome. I was working for banks. It was a really good salary. But my uh, um, mortgage was back in Estonia, so um, every time I sent money... Um, using using my HSBC account, I found that money goes missing somewhere. Like a lot less euros arrive than, than I expect, and um, and then I eventually figured it out, and it was really embarrassing. I figured out that the bank just uh, gives me a different exchange rate to what I was expecting, and everything was doing the right thing. Um, I was just stupid enough that I, I didn't realize this before. I didn't pay attention, but then uh, in order to solve the problem. Um, you know, being from, from that part of the world, there's always a solution. And uh, the solution was I had a friend who had the opposite problem. So he was uh, getting paid in euros by Skype and he was living in London. So his um, expenses were in pounds. And what we started doing was I just gave him my pounds. He gave me his euros. And then we just took the uh, Bank of England exchange rate and both of us saved um, 
quite a fat margin. So I saved on my transfers, he saved on his transfer, and we just changed, exchanged money with each other. So it sounds like a pretty straightforward thing to do. There's nothing really that clever, that clever about this. Um, and then uh, that was kind of solving the problem for ourselves. Then about six years ago, uh, we realized that although I had a, I, so I calculated, we did this with a group of friends. I calculated that uh, we had saved around 10,000 euros on those exchange rates, like 10,000 euros over um, like four years of doing this with friends. And uh, there's really no convenient solution for anyone else. So I knew some other people had their little groups where they exchanged money with each other, but there was no solution for this. And uh, so six years ago, we started TransferWise. Um, it was initially just two Estonian dudes who wrote a blog post that now you can send money to us. But we didn't expect that someone actually did send money to us. So someone sent like uh, 15 minutes later, 2,000 euros arrived on, on our account um, to be converted into pounds. And then we had pounds coming and then euros coming. And uh, by the end of it, it was, it was a real business. So. Um, from that moment, about six years ago, to now, when we're uh, putting about $1 billion through our pipes every month, um, it's been a pretty, pretty amazing story, a pretty amazing journey for us. Um, something that I'm most proud of is that we, we save roughly um, 1.2 million euros every day in exchange rates for, for people who use TransferWise. So every day, it's like a million euros every day. Can you imagine how many sports cars the bankers <laughs> aren't buying for that million euros? Um, so it's just kind of uh, stunning how, like, how much money is, uh, is being normally wasted in a, um, and it's just an inefficient, inefficient systems and inefficient economy. And of course, I'm super proud of that. One million that we save, there's about 300 million that the world still pays to banks for that, that, that very same service every day. Anyways, that's, uh, that's it. So um, that's, how, that's how we got started. And uh, I thought I'd, just while I'm here, I'll just uh, share uh, uh, share a couple of a uh, couple of th thoughts around this, and then you're all welcome to to ask me ask me any questions. The uh, uh, the interesting one was when I walked into this building was that there was this uh, title of the talk. This talk came about. Uh, actually, I didn't quite uh, get involved in this. Was how to build a really big business. Now you're a business school. You're probably thinking maybe you should build a business or something. I never wanted to build a business, and uh, I, it just never excited me. There was nothing exciting about building a business. But what was really exciting was uh, was fixing a problem, and that's how TransferWise got started. It didn't get started because me or my co-founder really wanted to build a business. That wasn't really the point of it. The point was that um, there was a problem. Um, the problem was quite apparent to us and to uh, to other people. So. We needed a business as a vehicle to make it work, a vehicle to fix the problem. And that's kind of over the time, that's what I've seen. Business is nothing else, it's just a, just a vehicle of uh, creating products, fixing problems, you know, whatever that the world needs. Business is just a, just a vehicle of this. It's not, a, it's not something for its own, for its own merit. Uh, Claudio will probably disagree, but... Uh, uh, regardless, uh, so 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 that's that's how we got started, and that's why I started with this uh, this little picture. You know, we're in London. We're quite famous. We're probably n not many know about us in Latvia. In London, we're we're quite famous, um, but mostly because of our uh, advertising. And you know, the advertising is quite interesting. It's not, and when you study business, you probably study advertising as well. Um, it's not really about uh, uh, building a brand, but it's just talking about the problem. So um, this guy, we put a, 
we're, we're put in the London Underground station. Uh, <laughs> it was just a, the whole day, him and a couple of other dudes played uh, like a, a, dr like a, a drunk, um, very ha hungover banker um, in a kind of a little show of what it's like when the party's over. Um, that's just one. Um, we got, that was our first advert. And that's very interesting. So when you study advertising here, um, the that was that was a big campaign. We were uh, <laughs> first surprised that someone let us put this up in London, um, but they did. So uh, so we went ahead, and uh, we could afford like that was four years ago. We could afford like five bus stations in some shitty bar shitty parts of London. But you know what? That didn't absolutely matter in the end because it was this picture that mattered. So you really, in, that, in today's world, you don't really need advertising. You don't really need to buy huge amounts of media space if you can. I mean, it's cool if you can. It always helps. But, but the important thing is uh, how people react to this and how do, they, how do they react to this online. So actually, the picture of this poster <laughs> was probably like hundred thousand times more powerful than the uh, than the actual poster itself because there's probably ten thousand people who noticed it uh, going past but there were ten tens of millions who probably saw this online and then uh, we we kind of continued so this is uh, where we found that um, you know it's it's I'm just leaving this up there for the ladies in the room uh, for a little bit. So the, uh, the understanding that we got quite soon was that although that we're trying to solve a problem, <coughs> that's very cool for, and we had like loads of people who, uh, who started using the product, but they actually started using it. So when I looked at the, I was doing customer service in the early days as well, like everything else, then the, um, the people who got in touch were, um, uh, I was just looking at their email addresses, they were bankers. So our first users were, yeah, actually it makes a lot of sense. So who knows um, like how the system works and what the flaws of the system are, of course, the people who are running the system. So um, like big uh, French banks like Société Générale and uh, Crédit Agricole uh, and their um, employees in London, they were the, the first ones who actually benefited from TransferWise. So um, and, and there was a lot of like a uh, lot of talk about this. People were super excited, super evangelical. But we found that um, um, the trick is not so much um, not so much about want, wanting to use the product, but really understanding that they have the uh, that they have the problem in the first place, first place. And just to be brutally honest, to think back when I did my first uh, transfers back from London to to Tallinn, I didn't know how much the bank was taking from me, and I uh, didn't think about it. It was only later when I when I found out. Um, I was really quite embarrassed, to be honest. Uh, felt quite stupid. And, and since then, like coming to that realization that Transwise works really well for people who, who understand the problem, we started doing uh, those uh, little stunts. So this picture is taken in front of the, the Bank of England and the, in, the, in the center of London City. And on one morning, uh, us, a um, couple of our uh, folks in the team, decided to uh, to make a little demonstration um, to show that we have nothing to hide, and uh, and we started drawing attention to the problem that actually the only reason that uh, um, that we're spending that much money on something that is as simple as sending an email. The the only reason that uh, that works is because you know. Banks are getting really good at hiding what they what they charge, so um, we call this. Uh, or we kind of started this under the the banner of no, nothing to hide, um, and and no hidden fees.
Good. Okay. Sorry about uh, you there. <laughs> Hello, my new friends. Um, <coughs> so, <laughs> so we started doing this. Um, uh, another one here was about uh, giving um, giving a chance for ba uh, for the banks to clean up. Um, you know, banks have a lot of trouble, and and some some of the worst things that they do have actually nothing to do with currency exchange. They're some pretty bad things, especially in in the UK that they've been that they've been caught with. So we thought we uh, again did in the in the centre of London, just a just a little kind of opportunity to to give them a bath. Works very nicely. Uh, a lot of bankers who are on the way to work got interested in this. Um, this actually got us uh, got us arrested for uh, for a little bit. That was in Barcelona. We didn't uh, we we didn't quite expect uh, the Barcelona police to be different to to London uh, London police. So s someone uh, someone got stopped by police for uh, for doing this. Um, no, well, no charges were pressed, but uh, we have to kind of respect the local culture a little bit more. And um, and this was the one that we did uh, also in London um, as a big uh, Halloween uh, party. Um, that uh, I think that picture is uh, special because it got a like from Mark Zuckerberg. Like all the team who was involved in in creating this was uh, was quite quite happy about this uh, fact. The um, uh, the s the story behind this was um, you know we we thought. It's cool to do those stunts, um, but it would be even cooler if we get our customers to do those. So, so that morning it was uh, they're all all very early morning. So we had uh, cars picking up customers in London at six o'clock in the morning for a secret thing, <laughs> and then when they when they gathered, uh, they uh, uh, they ended up somewhere where like people were getting body painted <laughs> into skeletons. Uh, we're quite worried, but enjoyed the day day very much. From there, we uh, f since then we've started it actually. You know, we're 650 people in in Transwise. Uh, you know, there's only so much that we can uh, do with that uh, small group. But you know, there's now millions of people using the product. So let's think about what they can do in terms of advertising. But uh, so this is this is. This this was all the kind of the fun and games that you maybe see from the outside. The reason why I, uh, I'm here to answer questions and uh, is is more about like how does this how does the how does this really happen? So this is a picture from 2011. Um, Co-founder and our first engineer. Uh, we're probably looking at some really ugly fer ugly version of the first uh, first transferwise. Uh, I want to say our first engineer at that time, he was also our only engineer. <laughs> uh, now we are 135 engineers. Um, so there's a, it's a quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of growth that's uh, that's happening in the company, and uh, and don't don't get me wrong, it's 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 not always carnival, um, because most of the time in the office it feels it feels a little bit like this. Um, we're just to give you an idea, we're uh, like our 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 business of moving money around, which is like a billion dollars every month, is 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 one thing, but we also um, we're also licensed as a like pretty close to what a bank needs to be in places like Japan, Singapore, Australia, Hong Kong, every single state of the United States, Canada. Etc. So actually, doing what we do it's look, can look quite fun on the outside, but it feels more like this on the on the inside, um, because the one the the kind of the system that we fix isn't <laughs> isn't really but it's more like this. So um, um, that's what I was hoping that maybe you have any kind of questions about or you want to hear more about. Um, that was my introduction. The floor is yours. Qu questions? Whoa! 
That's why we have the first row. Um, go. Do you want a microphone? Hi, thank you for inspiration, your story. Um, question is, uh, how do you remain the culture? So you are in the, how many offices you have? 10. How do you remain the culture in the, all the offices? That's a very good question. How do we, uh, how do we maintain the culture? So I was saying earlier that, uh, that we're here to solve a problem, but being a business is a vehicle. And being a business also means that there is a, there's a certain culture. And uh, the most powerful thing that you can achieve is, uh, is getting all those people work together very effectively on a common goal. Now the question was, like, how do we maintain this? That's very uh, interesting. A lot of people, actually my own shareholders and investors included, um, had the belief that as you grow, you're kind of, you get less effective or less efficient. That's kind of the common understanding that the more you grow, kind of it's I inevitable that you get slower and uh, you get less efficient. So my uh, kind of little uh, project from the beginning was how not to do that. So how do, how do we grow so that we don't get less efficient? Because I don't believe that there is any um, theoretical reason why you need to. There's no, there's no reason why you need to get slower. It just takes quite a lot of effort to, uh, to remain fast. And the, the way that we achieve this, and, and actually, so it's not about maintaining culture so much as to maintaining speed. So I just rephrase your question to be, to be more practical for the team. It's not like, you know, we have all this cool culture, we, like, how do we maintain this cool culture? It's more about, uh, we've been really good at doing this one thing, like how can we remain as good and as fast going, f going forward? So one of, the, um, kind of one of the narratives under this has been uh, what we call independent autonomous teams. That kind of realization came, uh, and if you Google it, I'm sure you find some of our blog posts, um, kind of early days, we had uh, um, we had this big engineering, like this one guy, but then we had a big engineering team of 10 people, and then we had 15 people, and we had all these great ideas of what we could build. And it didn't, uh, it got really slow at one point, because everyone was kind of, had a little project that they were interested in, and I was kind of arguing and planning. Most of the time was spent on planning what you would build. So the guys of you who don't work yet, you probably don't understand this, most of the time in a, in a normal organization you, you spend not building things but arguing about what to build. So we thought, you know, we can't really waste time on this. So what we created was uh, the units. Um, so we, we took this one problem of, uh, uh, the, the one problem of, um, uh, money transfer and split it down in, into smaller, smaller topics or smaller themes. Uh, so, for example, uh, we had a, uh, one issue that we were uh, we were very good at moving pounds into euros and euros into pounds in the beginning, and then uh, we realised that if we, it's not just a euro pound problem; it's the world problem. So we started. Uh, we created one team, um, and gave them the mandate that. This team, you're, you're gonna you're gonna make sure that there's coverage, that you can send pounds not only to the eurozone, but anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world. It will be up to you to choose how you prioritize which country to take first. It will be up to you to figure out how to get regulated in that country, how to get, um, um, you know, how to open bank accounts. You know, how to make the money move and how to physically then support the customers. But it was coverage is your job. So we called it the currencies team. Um, that team grew to, I think it was like 80, 80 people at one point, which in which it started uh, splitting up into regions. So we have the same thing now, but in different regions. So that, for example, gave us speed. We didn't, like, we didn't need to get involved in this. That team 
open, opening up new countries is as fast as TransferWise was in the beginning. Therefore, there's no, kind of no reason why we, at least in this context, need to slow down in any way. You know, the same goes in, uh, in other places. We have um, like the teams that do these uh, marketing stands. You know, they're, they're very clear. They have, on, they have only one mandate. How do people understand the problem they have and the problem that we help to solve? And all they do is go around with this one mandate and they figure out what the stunts are. Like, do they need to do stunts or something else? Um, and they, they work on that. We have a team that looks after virality. So a lot of our users actually hear from other users. They don't really care about advertising or anything else. They just, uh, they just do what their friends say is the right thing to do, which, which is basically what I do. Um, and and there's a team for that. There's a team who looks after virality. And they're pretty autonomous. They have all the engineers, all the product managers. Uh, they have marketing folks. So they can do whatever, whatever they like, as long as the rest of the organization kind of gives them feedback that they're doing the right thing. So sorry about the long answer. Next ones are going to be shorter. This is how we maintain speed. There's a lady in the back. Can you just say the question and I'll repeat? I would like to ask you about your future plans. Are you going to issue cards or maybe additional services? Uh, so thanks. Good question. What are our future plans? Um, what are we? Uh, are we going to issue cards? Um, so this is a very good question. My, uh, the way that I can explain how we think about this and then uh, challenge you back. The way to think about this is, you know, what are the things that are broken? Uh, then these are usually uh, things worth our time. So I was uh, explain, uh, explaining earlier how proud we are about um, saving about a million euros from, uh, from the bad bankers. There's literally like 200, 200 million euros every day that doesn't get saved yet. So that's a pretty massive issue, I would say, like a, almost a socially, social issue. And we have a solution. Like We almost know how to solve this. So this sounds like a, a pretty valuable place to put our time. Um, are we going to issue cards? Um, Maybe, but the question is, what is the problem that it's going to solve? Uh, yeah, I think if we, um, th that's, a, that's a very good one. So cards are overpriced. And now if you look into the detail of how cards are overpriced, um, you find that there are very interesting dynamics. Uh, and I don't want to bore every, everyone with you. Basically, every time you pay with a card, um, the the coffee shop where you pay or the website where you pay um, pays a bunch of money to the issuer of your card, and this is what's called this is a thing this is a thing called interchange um, as a kind of an agreement with Mastercard and Visa that this is always how it's going to be every time you pay with a card uh, something that you don't see there's like the underlying uh, kind of almost a bonus that goes to the goes to the issuer. Now, this is super hard to uh, super hard to fix because I honestly don't know what are the in incent. This is where I think uh, free market doesn't work. So I don't have a solution for this. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why we're not doing it because uh, you know how do you, how do you reduce the how do you reduce the prices? Is that I don't, I don't know either. That's why that's why we're not doing it yet. Hey. Here and among they are a total individual units, some kind of council or whatever. No, we don't. Uh, so the question was, how do we maintain coherence, how the teams work? That's a very good question. Um, without getting too philosophical, uh, you have to be clear why coherence is good.
Yeah. Think there are some. That's very good. So coherence is useful for uh, uh, efficiency. So sometimes you don't want to always invent, reinvent a bicycle. If the bicycle's already been invented, you don't want to reinvent it five times. So coherence is in some ways useful. Um, the, the challenge is like, if there's a little bit of incoherence, maybe that's even, even more valuable than the efficiency you get from it. So there's, al there's almost a, this kind of balancing act that you can be super coherent, um, but if, it's, uh, if every, everyone hates working this way, then uh, maybe you get a better result if uh, you work in a way how everyone likes to work, but it's slightly incoherent. There's, there's a little bit of inefficiency um, that's going on uh, in kind of atomic actions, but if you combine everything that's going on you actually get more result as being super coherent. So that's kind of the uh, arguing with a, your first hypothesis that coherence is always, always good. No, no, but, but the question was kind of uh, leading to this. But you need some of it. You, and then you're right, you need, uh, you need some of it. And um, the way that we do coherence is... Um, is by letting people like cohere almost themselves. What we do inspire everyone to do is we have this um, this process of um, we started talking about quite a lot about organization and and that. But so we have uh, these events that happen once a month where every team and we have I talked about the currency team. We have like 45 of those teams. So each of those teams. Uh, tells the rest of the company in a couple of hours, in an hour and a bit, what they're doing, what their challenges are, and what they're planning to do next. So if you know, or if you have a kind of a, a good high-level understanding of mm -hmm. what's going on in a each, of each of the other teams around you, you can choose to go here, because it's in your benefit to, to be more efficient. So I think coherence uh, we, we're actually quite coherent, to be honest, but the way that it happens is not because we say we need to be coher coherent, but because people want to be coherent, because it's more efficient. That's the kind of the, the logic how we arrive at this. We're not like 100%, but we're actually pretty good. Uh, guy in the back. IT infrastructure. with increase of tra number of transactions and maybe at what point was it most apparent or the first point? Okay, very, very good question. Um, technical question. So uh, the question uh, just repeating was when uh, did we start getting, like what were the challenges on the technical infrastructure and uh, how did we deal with this? Um, as you rightly noted, going from one engineer to 130 engineers, uh, suddenly you can build a lot more, a lot faster. Um, and what were the challenges? The, uh, the first challenge was that uh, uh, I built the first system and I'm a terrible coder. So, uh, that, was the, that was the first challenge. I think now it's solved. I don't think there's any lines of code that I've written in the system that everything has been replaced. Um, but then, practically, um, it's a little bit technical answer, but what happens to most, um, or it's, it's kind of, in the last couple of years at least, it was happening to many, many startups, is that um, when they start, there's always, uh, it always, or almost always starts with an app. So you, in the beginning, um, you don't know if it's gonna work or not, and we put this blog post up, we didn't know if anyone's gonna trust it. So what you first need to do is you need to build an app. And all you do is really building that app or website application and it should work really well. And, uh, and then you go, once you have ideas with new features or you wanna open up Japan or anything else, then you kind of grow that app. And uh, there's this stage that happens in every company's life where it's it's really hard for 
hundred people to commit to one code base. And what usually happens then is uh, it's like banks uh, in this region. Banks IT is pretty good in uh, in the UK. I think most banks have quarterly releases, so they release a uh, new system to their customers every quarter, once a quarter. Uh, Transferwise, we release twenty times a day. So today, by now, there's probably seven or eight releases have already happened to uh, uh, customer facing facing apps. So. It's it's super hard to do this when uh, you have one code base and hundred hundred people committing to it. So what everyone goes through is basically uh, taking this big app and 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 splitting it down. And it's driven by two things. Sometimes also your your system gets really slow because you've you know you built it on uh, technologies that you didn't understand or uh, or understand well enough. Um, or just the the data gr grows out of uh, what's comfortable, but actually, I think in our case, it was more driven by like how do you get most people working on the same code base most efficiently as to the first question, like how do you maintain the speed uh, so for us, I think so now we're on the other I feel like we're on the other side of this, but i to be honest, like two years ago, it was pretty tough it was pretty tough when you have this code base of many hundreds of thousands of lines of code and you need to split it out into 50 different code bases. That's, uh, engineers here will, will will know what it means. The guy in the back. Is there like a region or some sort of sector or cooperation you see your biggest growth potential at? So the question is, is there a region that we see being, being highest potential? It's a very good question. The, the way that our kind of general philosophy was that we put a product out there and who wants to use it, it's going to use it. And you know, we're going to help more people use it, but if eventually it's up to them if they want to use it or not. And, uh, and we've done this now in 60 countries, thereabouts. The, um, and, and there is a pattern that we're noticing and I think Brazil is a, is a great example of that pattern. Uh, we put transfers live in Brazil, and we didn't expect really anything. It's quite a far away country. We have very few Brazilians on the team. We, you know, we didn't know what's going to happen, and it absolutely uh, became a hockey stick. A super, super fast growth, and uh, and the conclusions that we've drawn is. A, the pain there is the biggest. If we look at, uh, if we look at Baltics and, and this area and, and northern, northern uh, Europe, Scandinavia, the kind of the hidden fees in the, in the bank transfers aren't actually that high. They're maybe 1%, maybe, maybe 2%. In Western Europe, they're like 4 or 5. In Brazil, it's 7, 8. So every time you make a transfer, it's like 8% of your money goes to the bank, and then 92% of the money goes where you want it to go. So the pain there is so much bigger. And even though TransferWise is more expensive in Brazil than it is in, in the Nordics, the, the delta is huge. And, and you know, once the product is so much better relatively to, uh, to what's expected, or what used to be the, uh, kind of the tra traditional parameters, that drives their growth quite a lot. And then kind of the, the way that it drives growth is then through some really successful uh, kind of local uh, thought leaders and blog posts have kind of talks about this, and there's a huge kind of follow followership. So to answer your question, um, where the demand is biggest, basically, because that's what you, I'm sure you're learning in the business school. Where the demand is biggest, your product's going to work the best. The question is, what was, what was our single biggest challenge in terms of scaling up? And uh, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, if you say single biggest something, then it's already a very good question. Uh, there are many, many challenges in, in scaling up. Um, it's always about, <coughs> I spent 
It, it's much less now. I used to spend about 45% of my time interviewing people. So just like literally going through interview after interview after interview when we're growing from you know 40 people to 240. Um, I think at the time I was still interviewing pretty much everyone that came through the the door eventually. Still interviewing almost every engineer. Um, that takes a that takes a lot of uh, a lot of time. That was it's a big challenge of growing, finding the people that you want to work together with, but also the kind of hundred people that you've already hired that they want to work with. That's it's quite a quite a challenge. I, th I thought we eventually got pretty good at it. If you ask for the single biggest guy with a beard, very very cool beard. Did you have the the interview in If so, what advice in terms of attract? Um, yes, of course. Um, other than the first time we raised money in 2012, um, every other time, every every following time, we had a choice. So we had a choice of uh, either raising money or not raising money. And even then, we had a choice of who we take this money from. There was never a single bidder uh, for the investment. And then, of course, you interview investors. <laughs> um, it's it's a little bit less work because there's less of them. Um, but of course, it's like marriage. You kind of uh, uh, you should date a bit before you get married. Um, and uh, and of and of and of course. For your future life and sanity, you want to bring on people who are, uh, uh, who at least understand uh, your mission, understand the reasons why you're why you're doing what you're doing, um, and um, and and understand also how that's beneficial for, um, like eventually economically be beneficial not to all not only to our customers but eventually also to their shareholders because you know they have uh, fund managers on their own the good thing is that uh, by the time we got to raising money in it's like 2012 2013 2014 this kind of the tech startup thing had already gotten through like first couple of iterations and uh, there was a kind of a whole host of what was considered like better practices by uh, by VCs, and there was also competition. So that's actually competition is super awesome when you also get competition with uh, among VCs because it's it's like quite a public industry. If you're uh, if you're a VC, the w the worst thing that uh, you can lose is your reputation. So being a dick to someone is is terrible and it usually comes out pretty pretty quickly. So it's uh in some ways nicely transparent. Transfer wise cash if not when you are going to the last time we publicly so we have this uh annual reporting that we need to do. The last time we did was a year ending uh la ending March for that year we weren't we were not cash flow positive um but the way the way that we think about this is actually from the beginning even though the, we managed to be seven eight times cheaper than the banks actually sending money is not that expensive so we do charge for for the service we charge seven times less than banks but actually um there's quite a there's quite a bit of uh money there even in the kind of the very small fee that we take so i don't see I, we've never we've never really seen uh, like financials being an issue um, unlike many other startups where our first transaction was revenue positive so we charged we charged for the very first transaction and we we kept doing this we've kind of adjusted the prices uh, depending on the cost base it's different in japan it's different in brazil it's different in in europe um, but the only way how uh, 
kind of business as a as a vehicle of solving a problem can work is when it uh, when it pays for itself. So that's kind of ideologically, it's uh, it's always it's always part of what we've done. It's just that at one point you have more to gain if you invest harder into invest more that you you yet make back. Uh, the guy in the back. And Thank then you. Come to you. <coughs> My question would be. When did the banks started to notice you as a competitor, and uh, what have changed uh, in attitude of the banks during the time? The question is, when did banks start noticing us as a competitor uh, and take action to it? Um, that is a very good question. I would, l I'm not so much anymore. I would have loved, at probably at one point in my life, I would have loved to be a fly on their, on their kind of boardrooms. I knew that. Uh, I met a like two years ago. I met a um, digital uh, chief digital officer of uh, Western Union. He says that he's uh, he's got uh, trans transferwise basically every screen printed out in his office and on the wall. He's <laughs> very uh, honest about this. Um, with banks, I think it's uh, slightly different. So maybe Western Union, these guys feel like okay, this is this purely technical thing that's coming and playing in a similar er area like us. With banks, um, the thing is money transfers um, and kind of cross-currency, cross-border transactions more generally. As a revenue earner for them, for universal banks as we know them, are usually like number six, seven, eight, thereabouts. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a huge thing for them. And to be honest, sometimes their cost base is even higher. So we had this, um, if you allow me, um, we had this uh, very funny experience in Hungary, of all places. In Hungary, there was suddenly, um, we noticed there's a huge growth happening. Actually, Hungary is one of our more successful countries in, in Europe. There's like a lot of, uh, the penetration of Transwise users is, is one of the highest there. The uh, uh, the interesting thing was we kind of started looking at this growth and uh, and we started hearing from customers that uh, their bank had recommended them to use Transwise, <laughs> which was uh, which is really awesome. So we reached out to this bank. There's a small bank. It's not a not a one of the major banks in in Hungary. It's a small bank, and uh, they said, "Yeah, we're you know we looked at." what we're doing you know our transfers uh usually take five days uh like 10 percent of them get lost somewhere <laughs> and then people call up and they're really angry and they shout at us and you know we all use transfers ourselves so <laughs> it's like of course we're gonna uh, recommend our customers to use transfers so they didn't get any kind of affiliate fees or anything they um we just send their customers as as a policy and they had they didn't even talk to us about this um, <laughs> I think to the extent where they put a like, transferwise banner on their home page. <laughs> uh, I was looking. I was in Budapest uh, uh, like six months ago. I was still there, uh, without kind of even asking us if 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 we mind doing it. <laughs> so this is uh, kind of this is a very different example to what you would uh, usually expect. By now, all banks are aware of transferwise. Uh, most most banks are at this. Don't want to meet. Bank CEOs kind of randomly they know of Transwise. They don't. They're not worried, and I don't think they should be. It's a small kind of small part of the business. It's not a ma massive revenue earner. Um, it's the uh, they they've got like a huge torrent of things where they need to change the way that they uh, operate. Um, the what what they do. So Transwise is just one of those things. Hi. Uh, so, h how did you keep your uh, team motivated while you were growing, like uh, from five to hundred or two hundred, and uh, opening the new offices? Uh, of course, there's salary, but uh, what else, like mission? And, uh so, I think uh, that's actually a no-brainer. So, when you're uh, so when you see a kind of a torrent of people coming through the doors or all the time. 
um, who want to use, there's more and more and more people every day who want to use your product, that's actually super motivating that you're building something that so many people want to use. That is, I think, the most powerful motivation there is. No salary or stock options can top that. Um, maybe kind of part of your question, I think what, has, what was tricky at, uh, at one phase was when we were uh, behind. So as I said, the hardest thing in scaling was interviewing and bringing on new people. So by the nature of it, we were like far behind. Um, um, there's kind of more calls coming in that people could take. They're working very long hours, weekends. Uh, you know, a kind of payment system in US broke down. Then people were kind of doing uh, night shifts to to fix it and so on. So at one point, it was definitely uh, uh, hard in a sense that complexity and volumes grew harder than uh, grew faster than we could uh, uh, bring on more people. Um, but I think we we got past that by just uh, getting everyone chipping in and 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 helping out. So I don't think there's a it, it is it can be tricky, but I don't think there is one kind of uh, switch that that works. There's probably been many, but I uh, don't know of them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, biggest uh, biggest fail um, we kind of I mean I'm trying to answer it a little bit because I honestly don't know what was the biggest fail it's probably I will um, the uh, so we uh, we fail all the time but we we don't fail with really big things, and um, I'm just trying to kind of um, explain why. The um, the reason why I explain about the culture, there's quite a lot of autonomy of teams are able to do uh, quite independent in in decision making and choosing what they want to fuck up, basically. But what they do before they fuck up is tell everyone in the company what they're going to do. So the, the chances that if you tell 100 people that you're going to do X, the chances that someone's going to tell you if it's a really bad idea, that it's a really bad idea, <laughs> is quite high. So there's this uh, huge amount of feedback that takes takes place in the organization so that the really big fuck-ups are, uh, I think, kind of uh, avoided thanks to, thanks to that. We fuck up all the time. We do, like, uh, advertising that no one really cares about. We uh, we built product that we've deleted and then built again and deleted and built again. I think third time and deleted. So we've we've done like not product but but features. Um, we put market we put countries live that we've then shut down afterwards. It's also a kind of a waste of time. But there are also there are, I think all the failures that I'm I'm thinking about when you ask this is okay. You wasted some time. You wasted some resources. Etc. You learn something on the way, usually, <laughs> and it's not too painful or, or not too expensive. Uh, him first. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, well, as much as I know, usually fintechs, well, a big problem for them to scale are those regulation issues and uh, compliance issues. Uh, what's your experience with this? How do you tackle with them, and how much of your efforts and time? It, 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 uh, that's a good question. I uh, was in the financial uh, services space uh, for new starters. Uh, there is regulation, uh, and because it's there's more of it there than in other industries. The question is whether um, whether it makes it harder, um, and how hard it has been to me. So for me, maybe the hardest one was when I did our first license before we got started in uh, spring 2010. Um, I was in a kind of cycling holiday. Uh, after a long day's ride, everyone else was going to a restaurant, and I had this uh, stack of printed out regulation that I was reading and filling in the forms. So that was uh, kind of my first acquaintance to to regulation. The uh, since then, I think my my learning or takeaway has been that um, 
there is a reason why we have regulation in financial services. And there's usually two. So my kind of very simplified view of financial services regulation is that there are two reasons why we have regulation. A, because usually the products are so complex that if you don't go to business school um, or study maths, you don't really understand the product. Um, and you're usually in a, you're quite often in a vulnerable position um, emotionally and financially. So there's con consumer protection is, I think, the biggest part to financial regulation. So you have to protect people who don't have the time to protect themselves or don't have the skills to protect themselves. And that's, that's the biggest part. And then the second part is <coughs> that, I, um, that, that we get exposed to is uh, it's basically governments being able to enforce laws. And they enforce laws, of course, on behalf of all of us. So they want to collect tax, but they should. So whoever moves money around should, uh, should make sure that it's, it's not inhibiting the government's ability to collect tax. And of course, uh, stop bad guys, baddies uh, buying guns and, and that stuff. So these two, two reasons are totally valid. So anyone who's starting a business should want to do those two things as well. So that's why I've never had an issue with regulation. Everywhere we go, we get regulated first. Of course, there are challenges that in some places it's built for a fax machine and you know it just uh, doesn't really appreciate the technology that is involved. But generally, the intent in, uh, in financial service regulation is good. Good. <coughs> Nationalist question. How many of uh, TransferWise workforce is Estonian expats or Estonians? So we are, uh, let me try and do the math in my head. Uh, we're about uh, 650 people. About 400 uh, odd are in, t in our Tallinn office. The Tallinn office is, uh, is the largest, with 150 or so, or just over 100 in London, which is the second largest. Tampa, US is about 50 people. In New York, US is about 15 people. Budapest is about 20 people. Uh, Cherkasy, Ukraine is about 20 people. Um, and then Japan, Singapore, others are, are smaller. So we have actually very little expats. We have uh, maybe six Estonians in our London office, maybe, maybe eight. Um, it's not a lot of, there's just not many Estonians around there, to be honest. And in, in Tallinn, <laughs> of our uh, 400 people, uh, I would say um, probably the Estonian, non Estonian mix is, I may be wrong, I get corrected later on, it's probably like 280 Estonians and 120 non Estonians, or maybe 300, 100, 3 to 1, roughly. Um, the uh, we have uh, quite a few Latvians, not enough, uh, both in our London office and in uh, in Tallinn. Um, we have people, and which is actually very interesting. We have people applying to jobs in Tallinn who come from uh, not from Latvia or Finland or even Russia or Belarusia. They come from uh, uh, Peru or from uh, Dominican Republic, or places like or Spain or Portugal. And, uh, and they're pretty happy to move to Tallinn and, and hang around there. So that's a, it's, a great, it's been a great experience that uh, we can, of those 100 non-Estonians living in, uh, in, in Tallinn, I think we facilitated their movement for maybe about uh, 60, 70 of them. Others were already in Tallinn. So there's a, it's kind of a bringing more people into this cold and barren place is uh, something I'm pretty proud of. Okay, lady up there. On the trends, they will develop maybe sectors of. 
quite different ones called descriptive technologies, but maybe you have your view which trends will be more, you know, popular become. So when this uh, term fintech came about, I was kind of uh, battling against it. I've given up now, so it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. We can use the word, word fintech. Really, the reason why I was battling against it was that, for most parts, you know what we do isn't any different. It's not like a, as a financial service is not a different service than what banks do or what Western Union does. It's just differently implemented. So it's kind of uh, it's very hard to uh, to kind of put some things into the fintech side and other things in the financial services side. Uh, so when you when you talk about fintech, I I just I think of it as any like non-traditional financial service, anything that's not a universal bank, basically. A anything that happens in financial services, I would qualify as that. What do I think is, uh, is, is going to happen there? I think then comes to what's, what's going to happen uh, in financial services overall and uh, how, we think of, how, how we think of money. Um, especially on this other end, maybe more lo longer term things around cryptocurrencies are philosophically quite interesting. So does a, how does a, a monetary system work where, um, where, where there aren't so many, uh, whether with the current gatekeepers as commercial banks or current actors don't necessarily need to be there anymore? Um, that's very that's that's very interesting. So I think there's a, a s currently quite abstract and semi-philosophical stream coming from uh, kind of the blockchain and cryptocurrencies angle, and then uh, there's this other thing which is I think Transferwise and a few other very specific kind of product companies are showing that parts of this uh, universal banking can be done so much better with technology. So this uh, th this kind of other stream is more challenging the kind of the universal universality of the universal banking, um, and um, and maybe creating a move to a more uh, kind of product specific um, companies like I don't know um, crowdfunding that would be just just better ways to get funding just. It's a new way of getting funding, and then uh, more of an infrastructure, which is, uh, which is maybe just uh, holding our money and doing payments, at, and 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 maybe that thing can be in the background. Maybe we don't need branches for that. So definitely, there's an evolution that financial services and especially universal banking would have to go through, inspired by those two streams. Good, looks like we're getting done. Okay. That was great. Can I have a last question? I have the right to. No, it's not the hardest. I see the Skype logo in the front page of your website, and you clearly indicate this is from the people that built Skype. So how much is the support of Skype and how important has it been? That's a good question. So uh, there is no <laughs> there's no direct relation to Skype other than my co-founder used to be one of the early em employees at Skype. And we have other people who have worked at Skype who have uh, come to TransferWise. Um, but I think the effect is bigger, so much bigger. So I've, I've never worked at Skype myself or uh, have any affiliation. The, uh, but what it means is by the time we got started in 2010, 2011, there was this inspiration that, uh, oh, wow, suddenly uh, you can do things differently than just calling with your phone. You can call with your computer. And actually people started, it's not so much Skype, but others started trusting things that happen online. Like we trust Google today with so many things. Ten years ago, this didn't. This wasn't the case. We didn't trust anything that was online, and even early days, we didn't. 
we didn't even think about a mobile app because no one would deal with their money on a mobile. You at least wanted to sit in front of a big screen and then take your time, log into your bank, and you know be comfortable with this. But what had happened by the time was that uh, people are, got used to online services, and certainly Skype was an inspiration of that. It was definitely a huge uh, story, and I think for many people who work today in TransferWise, it's also been uh, uh, an inspiration that something like this can happen in Estonia, or in Latvia, or in Lithuania, in a small country somewhere up north, pretty obscure place, where uh, where things that this can build can be built, and you know, my thesis is that the fact that uh, Microsoft paid, what is it, six, six billion, eight billion for, uh, for Skype is a tiny, tiny um, value compared to how much Skype has given to, to the rest of the world in productivity and uh, inspiration and everything else. So actually, the, the value of Skype, I think, has been much, much bigger than whatever transactions occurred uh, between the shareholders. Thank you very much. So I think a big round of applause. <laughs> For you here, when it's uh, some sweets, you need some humor because I know you will go on with some speech. And also, as you are in recruitment, I am giving you a list of our graduates that finished this year, so you can find them within our yearbook. Thank you very much, Christo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, thank you very much.